On January 19, 1841, Joseph Smith voiced a revelation that declared Nauvoo as the new gathering place for the saints. Much had happened since we left Joseph in section 123. After the expulsion from Missouri, 5,000 saints scattered, traveling east across Missouri to find safety in Illinois. Quincy, Illinois was 200 miles east of far west Missouri, and in 1838 had a population of 1,800 people. That city of 1,800 people took in 5,000 Mormon refugees. The citizens of Quincy did much to welcome the saints officially, resolving to an extent kindness to the saints, to speak out against those with prejudices against the saints. They helped them to find employment and housing, and their last official resolution, they resolved that we recommend to all the citizens of Quincy that in all their intercourse with the strangers, they use and observe a becoming decorum and delicacy, and be particularly careful not to indulge in any conversation or expressions calculated to wound their feelings or in any way to reflect upon those who by every law of humanity are entitled to our sympathy and commiseration. This generous example stands through time. Quincy was an important respite for the saints, but they soon began to move about 50 miles to the north to another bend in the Mississippi to a place originally called Commerce. There they cleared trees, drained swampy land, built houses, planted crops, and began to build a city. What we now know as Section 124 became a sacred charter for that city Joseph Smith called Nauvoo. This revelation centered the saints, enabled them to think of Nauvoo as a new home, and sharpened their focus as they worked to build up the city. As the Joseph Smith papers tell us, this was one of the few revelations from the Illinois period to be later canonized by the church. It served as divine direction for the saints for the duration of their time in Nauvoo. Mayor John C. Bennett read it at the General Conference of the Church in April. The text was published in June in the Church's Nauvoo newspaper, The Times and Seasons, as well as in September in the Millennial Star, printed in Manchester. And the saints in Illinois referred to the Revelation frequently in print and in public settings. My name is Janice Johnson. I'm a Willis Center Research Associate at the Maxwell Institute. And I, along with Joseph Stewart, the Public Communications Specialist at the Institute, will be discussing each week's block of reading from the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints Come Follow Me curriculum. We aren't here to present a lesson, but rather hit on a few key themes from the scripture block that we believe will help fulfill the Maxwell Institute's mission to inspire and fortify Latter-day Saints in their testimonies of the restored gospel of Jesus Christ and to engage the world of religious ideas. Hi, Joey. Hey, Janice. How are you? I'm good. Glad to hear it. There's a lot going on in this revelation, which we seem to say about every single week, but this is, in fact, the longest revelation canonized by the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in the Doctrine and Covenants. And as I was preparing for this, I didn't realize how much was in there and how many different themes that the Lord covers in this revelation to Joseph Smith. Yeah, definitely. The Lord has stuff for the saints to do as they establish the stake of Zion. Right off the bat, we start with, you need to write a proclamation. And I think it's interesting. They're speaking to government leaders the Honorable President-elect, which is William Henry Harrison, specifically mentioned here. But then also the Lord kind of acknowledges in verse 7, be bold. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. The leaders of the world are as grass. <laughs> they eventually won't be in power anymore. But that doesn't mean they don't try to make that petition initially. Certainly. I think about what President Russell M. Nelson said about the Lord loves effort in conjunction with this revelation in thinking about the ways that the Lord asks us to do things. Latter-day Saints sometimes have a difficult time explaining the relationship of faith and works to other Christians, especially to evangelical Protestant Christians. But in short, we believe that the Lord will do everything, but that we need to do our part to ensure that that takes place. And the Lord will give us the people that we need to accomplish what he asks us to. One of the people that the Lord gave to Joseph Smith to fulfill his prophetic calling and to help keep the saints safe was a man named John C. Bennett, who we'll talk a little bit more about his less savory future in a minute, but just want to quote from verses 16 and 17. Let my servant John C. Bennett help you in your labor in sending my word to the kings and people of the earth, and stand by you, 
even you, my servant Joseph, in the hour of affliction, and his reward shall not fail if he receive counsel. And for his love he shall be great, for he shall be mine if he do this, saith the Lord. I have seen the work which he hath done, which I accept if he continue, and will crown him with blessings and great glory. Now, it's not usual for someone who appears in the Doctrine and Covenants to end up being one of the great villains of early Mormon history. <laughs> Could you tell us a little bit more about John C. Bennett? Oh, goodness. I think that Bennett, I think that those ifs in those two verses are essential when we think about Bennett, but also when we think about any of us. The Lord works in if-then propositions, and the Lord does not guarantee that blessings are going to come. But often it is if we follow through with our part. John C. Bennett had great blessings. He had all of, he was a skillful talker. He was a tomato advocate. I'm sure that's primary in our <laughs> concerns about John C. Bennett. But he had a lot of skills. He had a lot of abilities and a lot of potential. He did not use all of those abilities as he should. No, he started out by helping Joseph Smith. He helps to write the Nauvoo City Charter, which grants Joseph Smith and the Latter-day Saint leadership a lot of autonomy as they're governing in the state of Illinois. This includes things like incorporating the Nauvoo Legion and giving Joseph Smith the right to oversee legal proceedings. But things start to go astray. He had worked as a preacher and as a doctor. He was the quartermaster general of Illinois. He becomes assistant president of the church. But then, as these things go astray, we add adulterer and anti-Mormon author and speaker onto this list. Yeah, we'll talk a little bit more about this as we get into section 132. But John C. Bennett learns about the doctrine of polygamy and uses it immediately to coerce women into sexual relationships with him. And I think this should go without saying, but I'm still going to say it. That's not something that's appropriate. John C. Bennett takes the tools that the Lord has given him, these great gifts of speaking and of communicating and to be able to convince people to do things. And he takes principles of the gospel and coerces people into doing things that he wants them to do, especially the women of Nauvoo. This is something that is not very savory to talk about. No one really loves talking about these things, but it's something that Latter-day Saints should pay attention to, that the gospel is a tool that can be used for great good, that the Lord gives us these gifts to do good things on the earth, but that we can also take the gifts that we are given and choose not to do the right things with the gifts that we've been given. Agency, how we use those gifts, is always going to be of primary import. And I think that's one of the things that is weirdly reassuring to me is that I ultimately have control over what I'm going to do with my gifts. I may be limited, as we'll talk about in future sections, may be limited in what I'm able to do. But in choosing to do what I'm able to, I am showing the Lord that I am ready to use the gifts that I've been given to build the kingdom. Yeah. And I think that there is a transition. So we talk about John C. Bennett and his gifts, but we also talk about others who the Lord talks about differently. But I want to go right now to verse 19, and it talks about David Patton, who was with me at this time, also my servant Edward Partridge, and also my aged servant Joseph Smith Sr., who sitteth with Abraham at his right hand, and blessed and holy is he, for he is mine. What's going on here? So to my mind, Joseph Smith despite having seen the Lord, despite having seen the Father, despite having seen all of these resurrected beings, is still very concerned about what happens after we die. What is life like? Are people taken care of? And David Patton, as discussed in previous episodes, dies at the Battle of Crooked River during the Missouri Civil War with the Latter-day Saints. Edward Partridge, the first bishop of the church, has also passed recently. And then Joseph Smith Sr. had also passed. And in the past year and a half, we have had to say goodbye to far too many people and without the customary ability to say goodbye to them. And so while reading this section this morning, I thought to myself, despite all the assurances that Joseph Smith has had that God exists, that salvation is possible through Jesus Christ's atonement, that he still doesn't know a whole lot about what happens to people after they die. And it seems that he's still searching for answers. And it's something that, that continues to weigh on his mind. Verse 22, we get one of those tasks that the Lord gives the saints. Build a house unto my name. But this is not the temple. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> 
This is supposed to be a healthful and holy habitation, which will be called the Nauvoo House, that the weary traveler may find health and safety while he shall contemplate the word of the Lord. They're building a hotel. They're building a place where visitors, and they expect visitors will flock to Nauvoo, and they want to take care of them there. Now, they have really grandiose plans for for the Nauvoo House, the hotel in Nauvoo. And if you go to Nauvoo today, you can actually see the foundation of the house extends much further than the house they eventually built in that place. But they have, and I think that we can begin to sense this kind of grandiose expectations that they have and these things that they are going to build in this stake of Zion. Yeah, Joseph Smith and the Lord that he worshiped never lacked for chutzpah, for boldness in what they were trying to do. Also, that doesn't mean that everything that is associated with this is going to be a good call. One of Joseph's calls at this time is to put the manuscript of the original manuscript of the Book of Mormon in the cornerstone of the Nauvoo house. Spoiler alert, things put in foundations of houses don't survive. This is why, even with all of the resources of the Joseph Smith Papers Project, the cooperation of the Community of Christ and the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints' historical departments, we have very few original manuscripts related to the first copy of the Book of Mormon. I think that we have about 28% of the original manuscript. Now, we've got a lot more of the printer's manuscript, but this is one of the primary reasons. The other reason is, you no, know, Emma's second husband, Lucy Bitterman, also there is an apocryphal story that he also gave out pages of the original transcription of the Book of Mormon. The original translation gave away pages as souvenirs for people who were visiting Nauvoo. Yeah, just stick with autographs next time, bud. But I think that it's important for us to think about my house being the place where Joseph and Emma Smith are going to live and extending it to thinking about the homes that we all live in, that we can create spaces that are sacred to each of us. Now, of course, there are people who grew up in homes that aren't particularly safe or welcoming, but in my mind, that means that we need to work even harder to create spaces where people can feel loved, can feel the spirit, and have good experiences overall. And maybe you live by yourself. I'm single. I live by myself. Well, me and my dog, Luna. Shout out to Luna. <laughs> but this idea at the end of verse 24, it shall be holy or the Lord your God will not dwell therein. We create holy places by what we do in those places. And we have an opportunity to create a home that becomes holy. Now, I can already hear some folks saying, no, some places are holy in and of themselves, to which I would say, then why do we dedicate temples? Why do we dedicate homes? Why do we dedicate chapels? It's because we are asked to construct a place where we can commune with the sacred. That place could be somewhere that's outside. It could be somewhere inside. Essentially, what it comes down to is we are responsible for creating places that we can commune with the sacred in our own lives. Yeah. During the pandemic, the mountain that's behind my house became a holy place to me. I needed that to get outside of the physical walls of my house, which normally are very welcoming. But during the pandemic, when it was harder, I also needed this mountain. And that certainly became holy to me. When we get to verse 25, the Lord gives them a new commandment. And building the Nauvoo house and then building another house to my name, for the Most High to dwell therein, as it reads in section 27, these are the two tasks for the saints in Nauvoo. This is what is going to occupy their focus. Joseph, we've talked about Richard Bushman saying before that Joseph is obsessed with temples. This will be the fifth temple that he has tried to build. It is only the second that will actually be built. But temples are central to Joseph Smith. He will not live to see this temple completed. But this is primary in their efforts when they get to Nauvoo. The Lord is centering them on building up the Nauvoo house and a new temple. Yeah, and something else that Richard Bushman has said elsewhere is that the temple is the axis mundi for Latter-day Saints, or sort of the orienting position from which we come from. And so connecting those two things together, the home and the temple are where we are expected to place our priorities and the things that matter most. Now, when we get to verse 29, 
the Lord gives us one of the reasons. So 28 says, for there is not a place found on the earth that he may come to and restore again that which was lost unto you or which he hath taken away, even the fullness of the priesthood. Now, I wonder if this is surprising to Joseph and to the other saints as they receive this revelation. But this idea that everything that they received in the Kirtland Temple, what we call the Kirtland Endowment today, was not everything. That there were more ordinances and more rituals, more rites, more religious rites to be restored. Fullness of the priesthood. Today we think about, we define fullness of the priesthood as kind of everything under the sun that has ever been revealed. But I think that it's one of those terms that we want to look at how it's defined, where it's used. The Book of Mormon says that it contains the fullness. Here, the fullness of the gospel, and then we get the fullness of the priesthood. Here, another reason in Verse 29, for a baptismal font, there is not upon the earth. Another reason why you need another temple, that they, my saints, may be baptized for those who are dead. Now, this surprises us. This comes out of the blue for us. But actually, the previous August, Joseph had preached baptism for the dead what was called a beautiful discourse. Joseph's text was 1 Corinthians 15. He said, the gospel of Jesus Christ brought glad tidings of great joy, and people could now act for their friends who had departed this life, that the plan of salvation was calculated to save all who were willing to obey the requirements of the law of God. Now, this was a miraculous thing. Seymour Brunson had died. A woman, Jane Nyman, was the first to run down to be baptized for her son. And this was witnessed on the hill. Who witnessed it on the hill? So we disagree over what the pronunciation of this name. I say Vienna Jakes, but I believe that Jacques or Jax is also acceptable. And I think that it's remarkable, especially in the past few years, as the church has opened up opportunities to witness at baptisms, that a woman was the first to witness for a baptism for the dead. And there's a beautiful painting commemorating this in Tony Sweat's book, Repicturing the Restoration, that I would encourage for all of you to check out. This baptism for the dead is something that has some parallels in an ancient practice, which is what is specifically mentioned in 1 Corinthians 15. I remember when I was sitting in divinity school and my Catholic formation professor started to talk about baptism for the dead and talking about that we have these baptismal fonts that were not used for the living. He was a former priest, a former Catholic priest, and said if we knew what to do with this, we would do something with this. Jeffrey Trumbauer, who is an expert in ancient Christianity, wrote this book, Rescue for the Dead, and talks about the posthumous salvation of non-Christians in early Christianity. He calls this, he talks about this practice. The Maxwell Institute's own Catherine Taylor is working on a chapter on the ancient practice of baptism for the dead, which we will see sometime next year when we in the volume that's coming out from the Maxwell Institute, preparing us to look at the New Testament. But verse 29 says, For a baptismal font there is not upon the earth. As the verses continue, the Lord says, This is an ordinance that should be done in the temple. But the Lord says, It's okay right now to do it outside of the temple, but for only for a time. I think that as it turns out, the Lord is pretty understanding about our circumstances. He doesn't force us to do things that we can't do. And so because the temple doesn't exist, he says, just use the Mississippi. It's going to be okay. Just keep working on the temple. But we shouldn't prevent people from obtaining the blessings of baptisms for the dead just because we haven't built a temple yet. And I think that it's interesting because the Lord also, in this instance, gives an expiration date and says, okay, you've got until October. You can continue to perform these baptisms for the dead in the river, but the Lord doesn't give the date at this point. But Joseph gets a later revelation in October of 1841 that says it's no longer permissible. You need to finish the temple. And they would actually finish the font 
in the basement of the Nauvoo Temple and build a little shack around it before the temple as a whole was completed so that they could continue to perform baptisms for the dead. Yeah, remember that the Nauvoo Temple isn't completed while Joseph is alive. This is something that happens right before the exodus from Nauvoo to the West. Latter-day Saints are working night and day to finish the temple so that they can access other ordinances in addition to baptisms for the dead. And there is great excitement in performing these ordinances. Volate Kimball writes to her husband, Heber C. Kimball, in October of 1840, and she says, Since this order has been preached here, the waters have been continually troubled. During conference, there were sometimes from eight to ten elders in the river at a time baptizing. Temperance Bond Mack, who's actually Joseph's aunt, writes to her daughter, Harriet Mack Whittemore, in September of 1841. She was baptized for her father, her mother, and her husband. And she says, thus releasing them from prison. I think how much you would have rejoiced to have done it yourself. Could you see the order instituted by heaven? This is a joyous thing. Yeah, I wonder if Joseph and the early saints are also thinking about the promises in Malachi that the hearts that children will be turned to the fathers and the fathers to the children. It's just a really special idea to me and something that has a lot of value to me that I can connect with my ancestors as well as those who have died without knowledge of the gospel, that through my action, through my own prayerful, worshipful action, which benefits me, they too are released from prison and are given the opportunity to extend. Again, Latter-day Saints believe in grace so much that we believe that even after you are dead, that you are not immune from